just cut out a third of it, and that totals the, what they cut out, a billion dollars. And what is, what is Bill Gates worth? About 80-something billion? <laughs> and of course, North Korea has been a threat to the world. Look what they did, those North Koreans, lying, lying right in front of our faces for everybody to hear that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and ties to al-Qaeda. And look what the North Koreans did to obliterate, to destroy an entire nation of Iraq, kill over a million people. Oh, and those North Koreans, you know, after their leader won the Nobel Peace of Crap Prize, yeah, what he said was that, I'm going to send 33,000 more troops into Afghanistan. And then Gaddafi has to go. Then those North Koreans, look what they did to Libya. Look how they destroyed a sovereign nation that did nothing to anyone. And those North Koreans, Assad has to go, I says. So look what they've done. They slaughtered over 500,000 Syrians, those North Koreans. We got to watch them constantly. Now they're in Somalia. They're in Sudan. Oh, yeah. You know, of course I'm being... <laughs> Talking about America. <laughs> yeah. I mean, North Korea has not done anything to anybody. The United States is dropping bombs on their border. Could you imagine if North Korea was dropping bombs and they had a deal with Canada and they're dropping bombs on the Canadian U.S. border and over to our off Newport News over there to the to the east, we got the Chinese doing massive maneuvers over at Newport News. And down in the Gulf of Mexico, we got the Russians. And over there in California, we got the Iranian fleet doing massive, quote, war games. How long would America tolerate that? About five minutes. They'd be bombing the hell out of them. But the United States is doing this to every country that they don't like. And the prostitute little media, these little boys and girls, I have to be equal. They're nothing more than political whores. They get paid to put out. They get paid to put out propaganda, and that's one of the major stories in the Trends Journal, the propaganda that they're selling us. So now let's go back, Richie, to the Korean War. Started by the United States after they propped up a dictator in South Korea that was in bed with the Japanese who, of course, you know, they had those wonderful women that they turned into slaves over there so they can have sex with the, with the Japanese soldiers. You remember those, yeah, right? Yeah. We won't talk about that. The United States took that guy that was working with the Japanese and put him as the head of South Korea. The United States killed over 4 million North Koreans in the Korean War. The pilots used to radio back, there's nothing left to bomb. Look at the photos of North Korea. You see all new buildings. It's not like they just invented the joint, you know, 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. They destroyed everything. So now I am a believer in Second Amendment rights, the right to bear arms. That doesn't mean I'm going to use them. Why isn't North Korea allowed to bear arms, considering what they saw happen to Gaddafi and to Hussein? When they didn't have nuclear weapons. Jack, you're dead. So here we are. Remember those old gunfights they used to show on TV? You know, those old westerns? And the two guys are facing off each other. And their hands are ready to grab the guns, you know? They had them strapped around their waist. Now, suppose we're watching one of those. And you and I are in the gunfight. And I say to you, hey, Richie, let's not draw. Let's talk first. And you say, okay. And then I'd say to you, as I'm pointing my gun at you, but drop your gun and then we'll talk. Yeah, yeah. North Korea has been wanting to talk with Americans about peace forever. And all Americans keep saying is we won't talk to you until you dismantle your defensive and offensive military systems. America is threatening North Korea with 300,000 troops on its borders these massive, quote, war games. Oh, and look at the major media now. All these, again, these little prostitutes, these boys and girls that get paid to put out by their Washington Johns and their corporate war masters. How about Russia's having military drills, you know, with Belarus? Yes, that's right. Major front page, front page of the Financial Times today. 
But America has these massive drills off the shores and borders of North Korea, which are basically drills to attack the joint. And that doesn't make the news, or barely does. Bases in so every country. That's what I have to say about North Korea. Bases in every country in the world, well, most countries in the world as well, surrounding Russia with military bases. How serious... I mean, we saw that, that test. And again, I, I'm not agreeing with you just for the sake of agreeing with you. I, I'd like to find a devil's advocate position to take against what you say to make it interesting for our listeners. It is interesting for our listeners, but... I can't argue with you, Gerald. Of course I can't. So he's understandably doing weapons readiness tests for the eventuality that he's attacked. That's Kim Jong-un. If those tests continue and another long-range missile is tested a couple of thousand miles or a couple of thousand kilometres, how serious is that in terms of the possible response from the United States? Is Trump just playing to the gallery talking about destroying people because we've heard from more sensible I know you haven't I know the media it's, it's, it's probably only slightly better here than it is in America it isn't really but we've had a couple of you know more sensible voices here today speaking on British News saying look it's silly by Trump they're not going to bomb North Korea because they would be able to obliterate the South within a matter of minutes so what is likely to be the Trump government's response in the event of another test yeah, what they did, what they just passed a, uh, a new bill, $700 billion for the military. That's what they're doing. Yeah. It's the military industrial complex. And, and what we have now is we have the military running Americans government. This is anathema to everything that, that, um, this country was founded upon. Eisenhower would be turning in his grave, a five star general, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, who warned that the military-industrial complex was robbing the nation of the genius of the scientists, sweat of the laborers, and future of the children. And now it's happened. Who's running the White House? Mad Dog Mattis, McMaster, Kelly, three generals in top positions. As we wrote in this Trends Journal, Trump is merely back in military school. That's all it is. He's taking orders from the generals. You know, and Trump and I are the same age. I may have said this on your, on your show before. The greatest threat when I was a kid, when, <laughs> believe me, you know, I was, they couldn't control me. Your little <laughs> SOB, we had enough of this. You're going to military school. That was the great threat. Now, here you are. You're a teenager, teenage boy. You know, grew up in the Bronx and Yonkers. What are you thinking of? Thinking of girls. girls yeah. I'm thinking of a car. <laughs> and I'm thinking of sports. The last place I my mother, man, so rest in peace, a great Italian, you know, woman. You know, she's, I mean, Italian women spoil their sons. You know, I'm eating the finest food possible to be cooked. I'm going to go to military school? Trump was so narcissistic they sent this rich, rich little boy to military school, not far from us in Kingston over here, in Cornwall, New York, a little, a little uh, concentration camp. Now, here this guy, look at the pictures, Google it up, Trump in military school, dressed up in military drag, learning how to make his bed with the right corners and eating crappy food and saluting. Yeah, I salute. I got a salute for you. You see that one? This is what this little boy is doing. And now Trump is back in military school taking orders from the same guys that used to give it to him at New York Military Academy. And, these are, and with the Goldman Sachs gang in charge as well. And these are men, of course, they're neoconservative to the bone. Zionist no, they're not the neoconservatives. No, I'm sorry. You don't they're think sick so. SOBs. Yeah. They're psychopaths. They're little boys with bad attitudes that love to kill people and haven't had a victory to mark up. If I'm in business and I'm showing one failure after another, I'm not in business. But these arrogant guys with their bad attitudes and guns that they'll kill you with keep killing without one victory. Not one victory, but a lot of bad attitude, arrogance, and murder. Well, you said it all. I mean, the, war, the, the government's, you know, look at the centerfold of the Trends Journal. It's done by Anthony Frieda. It's my... my my concept and Anthony Frieda, great illustrator's work. And it's, here's a, here's a, a gift for your, 
beloved family and friends who ignore the facts. And we have the presidential reality show, and then under it, who's your favorite freak? And we have all the freaks from all the political parties, the central bankers, and on and on. So all it is, you have freaks running your country. I mean, look at the little, look, one freak after another you got over there. The same here. Go to Germany. Hey, you been in France lately? It's a freak show. People are letting freaks run and ruin their lives. I mean, look at them. How could anybody with a half a brain listen to them? So they're all little sellouts. They're nobodies that have never worked a day in their lives, been sucking off the public tit and telling you what to do. That's Brexit. They could care less about the people. I just told you that in the United States, they just voted for a $700 billion defense budget. And then when you put in the black ops and the CIA, all the other stuff, we're looking over a trillion. Well, now they just had hurricanes in Houston and Florida, and the, the homeowners are losing everything. They give them a couple of pennies. Where are the troops? You mentioned they're, what, in over 80, 800 bases overseas? Yeah. How come the troops aren't there rebuilding these homes? You know why? Because that's what they think of the Americans just like your May over there. Who's that other guy? Johnson with that funny hair. What's his name? Boris, Boris Johnson. Boris yeah. who? Boris Johnson. Boris, Johnson. Boris Clown? Yeah. Boris Moron? Boris Imbecile? Boris, you little piece of crap, nothing? How could anybody, I, how could anybody, anybody with a half a brain take orders from that little clown? And look what they do. Here comes the queen, man. Roll out the red carpet. Dress up all these little guys in their military drag and salute every country. You look at Trump going out of the helicopter, saluting this little clown next to him. Yeah, I, I salute. I got one for you. Look what's going on. When are people going to have some courage? When are they going to stand up? Hey, look what they just had the Emmys. Oh, it was a big deal. Oh, it was all anti-Trump. Not one word, not one word for these little clowns over there in Hollywood, you little losing, little pieces of garbage about peace. Not nothing about the wars going on. All these little, oh, we need more transgender bathrooms. Yeah, how about taking a leak in the street? Absolutely right. Can I nothing about peace. How can anybody that has a half a brain look up to a Boris clown or a Trump or a Clinton or an Obama? or a bush, or a penis Cheney. It's the people, man. I've had it. I'm so sick of writing down the facts anymore. It's a freak show, and everybody loves their freak. Don't ever get tired of writing the journal, um, mate. I, I mean that. It's absolutely vital that there's some semblance of free media in uh, the US and in, um, in the UK. Um, we might have just um, we just lost you momentarily. Thanks for calling okay. back there. I was Everybody making the point. Everybody loves their freak. It's yeah. a freak show. And when are the people going to stand up? How many more facts do you need? How many more facts do people need that they're getting shafted? It's a multinational takeover. You're you're a slave for the multinationals. Taxes, taxes, so the elite could live better. And the politicians. So anyway, that's where I'm at. I understand. It might sound a bit patronising, me saying to you, I understand your frustration because I've I've not been alive to this for anywhere near as long as you have. And I certainly haven't been doing what you've been doing for nearly four decades or, or longer, telling people the truth. But I just wonder if there's just a tiny bit of optimism to be found in a couple of bad stories. Yes. You know what I mean? The, opti the optimism, Richie, is that we have an opportunity to change it now yeah. that we've never had before because it's such an obvious freak show. We, it, that's what I love about Trump. We got a freak now that's ahead of the freak show. You got freaks in the UK. You need a bigger freak than the two you that, and then who you got running the joint May now. Again, Boris Karloff over there? Yeah. <laughs> it's the story I'm thinking of. A big story broke here today. The Electoral Commission, which is the watchdog for elections in the UK, has recommended that internet trolls who target politicians 
have their right to vote taken away from them. And another couple of very interesting stories like that, a couple of very well-known broadcasters have lost their jobs for giving an opinion, a pretty harmless opinion, on a couple of social issues. And we know that in this coming parliament, the UK government is going to try and crack down on what they call online extremism, which basically yeah. means, you know, anybody who disagrees with them. But in those stories, Gerald, I get a bit of optimism because, like you touched on there, they seem to know that they're not safe. They seem to know that something is coming for them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be acting the way they're acting. I don't know if you agree with that. I agree 100%. They know it. Look, I, I, I've, been in, I've been there at, 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 20, at a graduate school. I was the number two guy running the political, the mayoral campaign in Yonkers, New York. I mean, this is a city of 300,000 people. I was the assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate. I was the chief government affairs specialist for a major portion of the chemical industry in D.C. I know I got pictures of me and Ronald Reagan, John Connolly. I met with General Anthony Zinni. I've been with, I've met with Major, you know, your clown over there. I've, I've been with princes. I've been around. They're, they're nobodies. They're regular people. And when people stop, that's why they put on all of these shows. Like you got this little Katzon Macron over there in, in, uh, in, in, in France. At, the, at Versailles, putting on all these sideshows. So that people get taken in with the theatrics. There's nothing there. It's an old man behind a curtain with a dog. It's the Wizard of Oz. And what's happening now, Catalonia, that's a big one to watch. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. They're, they're threatening the people to have a vote. They're going to bring in the, the truth. What, didn't the Spanish overthrow the joint and now they, the people want it back? You know, it wasn't always part of Spain. A fascist overtook it. Oh, he was the king, the king. Yeah, here comes the king. You know, so what I'm saying is, Richie, the opportunities now have never been better. Never, never, never better. Just but we, we've got about five minutes left on this and knowing you, you probably have um, plenty more uh, media appearances to do today. But you, in this quarter's edition of the journal, which, which I got yesterday, I've been flicking through it. Uh, I'll read it thoroughly over the next couple of days as I always do and I make reference to um, some of it in future programs. Go to trendsresearch.com, folks. Subscribe to the journal. Uh, I don't endorse anything really on this program. I endorse it because it's brilliant. I've been reading it for years. Uh, Gerald Salente is our guest. Um, just to talk about, you know, you're talking a lot about propaganda. And I saw an amazing article written by an independent journalist the other day about how the elites and about how the media are trying to basically crack down on uh, our right to cause offence as a means to starting a public debate on anything, Gerald, you know. So you might have an opinion about an Irish broadcaster was fired recently because after he said, Gerald, that a young girl who was raped didn't deserve it, didn't ask for it, didn't do anything um, wrong, she didn't deserve it at all, and the bastard should go to prison for years, he then said... But the girl was comatose on the floor of a bathroom because she got so drunk um, she couldn't stand up. And he asked the question, do we need to have a conversation about personal responsibility? So the feminazis and the Irish media said that he was victim blaming and basically have had him thrown out of his job. It's a massive story in Ireland. It's localised, but it has implications for broadcasters and writers the world over and there's been a, quite a number of stories like this recently where somebody has said something harmless to start a conversation and yet they were shut down very quickly you mentioned the trans issue we've had that over here where broadcasters who are against you know um, people using bathrooms other than the gender with which they were assigned which is a fair point of view and everybody's entitled to their opinion they've been threatened as well it's kind of tyrannical I know you've spoken a lot about this what do you think? Well, again, think of what the things you're talking about. All these, you know, identity issues. Nothing about the major issues. Nothing about war. Nothing about peace. Nothing about freedom. Nothing about enlightenment. 
So that's what they're doing. As I mentioned, you had these moronic Emmys. Yeah. All it was was a hate Trump show. And all these little clowns, these little nothing boys and girls, not a man or woman among them, not one word about, oh, we're in Afghanistan now for how many years and they're sending more troops? Oh, we just had 9-11, totally out of the news. Oh, the United States is slaughtering people in how many nations? So now we're talking about these identity issues. And that's what they're doing, Richie. And that's why people that are tuning into the mainstream media, if you like to masturbate, don't do it in public because that's what you're doing when you're turning on the mainstream media. You're just part of the circle jerk. Well, not completely and not necessarily at all, Rory. Uh, maybe to just clear up uh, some conceptions, the, the uh, Treasury Secretary, in theory, uh, serves at the pleasure of the President of the United States who appoints him uh, as, a, as a cabinet minister. Uh, but to be completely honest with you, I, I quite wonder about the sincerity of whether the President truly gets to pick his Treasury Secretary at all. Uh, and and in terms of lines of reporting, I don't really know who or what the Treasury Secretary reports to, other than to surmise that it very likely is the deep state or the globalist entity, as we refer to it as, uh, or 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 somebody who represents them, um, because what what the Exchange Stabilization Fund really is in my view anyway, and what my research shows, it's, it's, it's really a black hole uh, where, where dark money resides, and it's used as a catch-all to, uh, to enact globalist policy and to uh, primarily, uh, as its mission statement, when it was created, uh, states it is to uh, support and perpetuate the primacy of the U.S. dollar in global markets, and so when I, when uh, to 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 bring it, bring this up to modern times, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that in practice what the exchange stabilization fund is used for, uh, it's it's the it's the horsepower that is used to. Uh, suppress precious metals prices uh, it is the it is the horsepower or the catch-all that uh, provides endless uh, endless bids for US government debt uh, which which is falsely characterized as the US debt markets having such resounding liquidity uh, and depth when when in fact, it's it's really it's really not much more than a cheap parlor trick where you've got a whole bunch of dark money that's not even acknowledged to exist, and uh, th this this pool of dark funds, which in my belief is numbers into the into the many 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 trillions, is used to backstop everything from U.S. government bond auctions, uh, uh, and to sopping up. Uh, the liquidations of uh, America's traditional financiers when they dump U.S. debt uh, supposedly and ostensibly to teach America lessons when America's behaving on the world stage in, in ways that is not uh, becoming to uh, world powers. Um, you know, they threaten, and we, we've, we see the idle threats often, even in the mainstream media, uh, we hear things like, well, China could could really cause trouble for America by liquidating liquidating their U.S. government debt because they're they're they are uh, I think currently they're the largest holder of U.S. government debt, and typically it's a it's a toss up between them and Japan and often Saudi Arabia as to who the largest holder of U.S. government debt is. Uh, but let's just say anytime foreigners want to want to sell u.s government debt there there's always a bid and and if any if anything i've noticed in the last five seven years when foreigners have sold u.s government debt uh with with conviction we've actually seen the 10-year bond rally so you know when you're when your biggest financiers are dumping your debt 
and and your debt rallies and other countries are not visibly picking it up um, you know y you start to think about that where where's the debt gone who bought the debt and 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 why is nobody else's foreign exchange uh, or foreign reserve account uh, uh, burgeoning with with this liquidated debt and the re and the reality is sadly is this debt is being bought and it's being memory hold uh, by the exchange stabilization fund it's being bought with dark dollars and then those bonds are being retired to the black hole the same place where the money that came to purchase them came from and this this also Rory uh, by extension goes a long way to explain why the US government has never had a failed bond auction um, I can tell you that I worked in the institutional markets in, in the debt markets in the 80s and the early 90s and I can tell you that Western countries uh, major Western countries like Germany France, Italy, they've all had failed bond auctions in the past. And the only country that comes to comes to mind that's never had a failed bond auction, at least at least for public consumption, is, is America. And I would contend to you that the reason that America's never had a failed bond auction is because the heft of the exchange stabilization fund is always standing in the background, willing and ready to do its job to stand in and sop up the excess supply of U.S. government debt to, to, to maintain the illusion in world markets that the dollar is worthy of the mantle of being the world's reserve currency and, and, and basically infallible. And the notion that America's never had a failed bond auction starts to make me think uh, in terms of in conspiratorial terms in that you know I, I, I think of sports analogies and I think I think in terms of baseball and I think in terms of people who go up to bat in Major League Baseball and there aren't many there aren't many uh, batters you know who bat a thousand as a matter of fact <laughs> as a matter of fact there's never been a batter who's batted a thousand but America with their bond auctions do sport a 1,000 batting average, and no other country on the planet can uh, can actually make that claim. Only America. So, you know, that's maybe a little bit to digest, but there you go. Well, that's that would explain a lot. I mean, as far as the the dollar. Well, it's and and I mean. Uh, without splitting hairs, we're, we're not necessarily exactly saying that the supply is endless, although it very well may be. But what we are saying is that the, the amount of dollars that are in fact in existence is very likely, uh, at least in my view, uh, extremely larger than the amount that is believed to be in existence. And what this does is it gives the exchange stabilization fund a whole lot of wiggle room because it has an absolutely almost unthinkable amount of resources it can bring to bear to uh, uh, make things appear other than they should. And for, for people who might scoff at the notion that any entity could possess such a crazy amount of uh, money that I refer to as dark money, you know, all we have to do is uh, think about the undocumented, uh, um, let's call it the undocumented waste uh, of money uh, by the U.S. government uh, in recent years, which is uh, purported to be, uh, I mean, this is, this is something Catherine Fitz talks a lot about, uh, money that's missing from the U.S. government that they can't, they can't account for and they cannot document where it's gone. And I mean, she comes up with numbers and she's an extremely highly credible person who's been in government and, and who has uncovered massive fraud uh, in her own right. Um, but, you know, amounts that are alleged to be or, or admitted to be uh, undocumentedly missing uh, amount to, I think, 18 or 19 trillion. So we're, we're talking about an amount of money that is accepted to be missing or unaccounted for that uh, uh, amounts to virtually 
the entirety of the U.S. government federal debt. Well, uh, volume that the amount of global debt has been underestimated by 14 trillion. How do you miss 14 trillion dollars? You don't. Well, you know, it's I find it I find it humorous because these these are the very institutions that tell us that tell us they're going to bring stability right. that, that 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 ensure us that, you know, the path they're on uh, geopolitically is 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 a, is a sound is a sound course, and that all will be well. I mean, you know, geez, Rory, we're talking about fourteen trillion here, eighteen or nineteen trillion there. Pretty soon, we're talking about real money. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, what could humanity do with, we'll say, thirty-two trillion dollars? What could what could humanity? I mean, everybody on the planet. Well, I mean, I, I'll give you an idea. I'll give you a couple things that humanity could do with thirty-two trillion dollars. They could affect regime change in probably seven or eight countries over the last six or seven years. They could uh, they could suppress the price of precious metals and have their nominal values nailed to the floor, and uh, uh, you know, and they could probably make the most indebted country with uh, with with more debt uh, out than any other entity ever on the planet. They could probably make that debt market look like it's. Uh, like it's strong, vital, and, uh, and, and, and very liquid. Latest one was Christian coming out and saying that physical gold will be priced higher by 2020, no later than 2020, and it'll be on an annual average basis north of 1700, while at the same time he's saying that Gold, gold price suppression manipulation is nonsense, and yeah. this, so I mean, what is what is up with this string of events? No, oh, but Rory, you forgot the punchline. No, no, no sooner, no sooner had uh, Mister Sewermouth himself, Jeffrey Christian, made the comment that uh, gold price suppression was ridiculous and doesn't occur, and it's and people who espouse such are fools, uh, then literally before the, uh, let's just say before the inks dry on that statement, uh, the ex-gold trader from uh, Union Bank of Switzerland, UBS, is, is arrested while vacationing in America for uh, gold price suppression. <laughs> yeah, we can't forget that. <laughs> I mean, Mr. Jeffrey Christian, we need to get him, we really need to get him a red nose, a polka dot suit, and some big shoes, because if, if, if we're going to listen, if we're going to listen to his diatribes, we need to dress him appropriately before we treat ourselves to, to the absolute sewage that, that flows from his mouth. I mean, what do you think about that in light of him saying that physical gold is going to go higher? It's going well, to be higher. And well, the, when 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 Mr. Christian says that gold's going to go higher, higher, it seems to me to rhyme with or, or or echo the words of of another one of my favorite and 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 one of the best dressed and best looking gold commentators in the world, uh, Mr. Jim Rickards, and Miss, Mr. Rickards, who I call Mr. Globalist himself, uh, he he. Uh, he is he's he does a very good job at giving us commentary on the gold market where he always seems to have interspersed with his disinformation kernels of truth because Miss, mr but i will give him one 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 thing i will say for rickards is he he will actually discuss or talk or or allow to be mentioned the uh, the exchange stabilization fund but in doing so, he he makes he errantly makes the claim that the exchange stabilization fund is uh, is transparent, and he claims that the exchange stabilization fund publishes annual financials, and he claims that the exchange stabilization fund has a very very finite and known amount of resources at its disposal, and. Um, to respond to those errant claims and, and completely false claims of Mr. Rickards, disingenuous claims, 
I would, I would uh, recommend all of your uh, listeners to go to a website called marketskeptics.com. Look in the right-hand column. Uh, this, this is a site that was set up years ago by a, a researcher uh, and, a, and, a, and a tremendous brain uh, by the name of Eric D. Carbonell. And I want you to look in the right-hand column of his homepage of marketskeptics.com, and I want you to look for a heading that says something I've, that I've been afraid to blog about, and click on the link on the right-hand side of the homepage, and it will take you to a five-part uh, uh, tutorial, a YouTube tutorial on the Exchange Stabilization Fund, its roots, why it was set up, and, and, and what it does and the relationship between the Exchange Stabilization Fund and the Federal Reserve in that the Exchange Stabilization Fund was created by an act of Congress in 1934. When it was set up, it was seeded with about $3 billion in 1934 money. And, and that money was a windfall that was created after the U.S. government confiscated gold from citizens and, and made citizens turn in their gold for $20 an ounce. It was six months later, the gold was revalued up to $35 an ounce, creating a windfall of roughly $3 billion. And that $3 billion in 1934 dollars was used to seed the ESF, or the Exchange Stabilization Fund. And that overnight created the, the world's most financial, uh, powerful financial entity, the SF, and that, that money that it was seeded with has been growing in perpetuity uh, without, without, you know, not subject to taxation or oversight. And uh, uh, Mr. De Carbonell's uh, expose on the Exchange Stabilization Fund points out that the much of the activity that the U.S. government is involved with around the world, um, uh, it's, it's all at the hands of or at the direction of or typically at the direction of the Exchange Stabilization Fund. But the ESF uses, uh, you know, uses U.S. government agencies like the CIA, like the uh, intelligence community, uh, to to carry out their actions, whether it's regime change, gun running, you name it. And on the financial end, the relationship is the ESF acts as principal and the broker, uh, their exclusive broker, is the trading desk of the New York Federal Reserve. And when the ESF has something to do in the financial markets, like suppressing the price of gold, the orders are sent from the ESF to the New York Fed the New York Fed then disseminates those orders to the commercial banks, their magnificent five in America, which are J.P. Morgan, Citibank, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman Sachs. And these just happen to be the entities in America that have one time or another sported uh, derivatives books in notional anywhere from, say, 50 up to $85 trillion. And... Uh, uh, Coincidentally and interestingly, um, these banks in the last 20 years have seemingly never, never experienced a loss in their derivatives book. So if you want to think about five banks, 20 years, four quarters a year, and uh, none of them have ever had a, uh, have never had a really reported a loss from derivatives operations. And here again, we're getting back into the notion that we have we have people on on a team or players on on a, on teams that you know are batting a thousand. And let me tell you, as 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 a as a person who's come from the institutional universe and dealt with trading desks at banks for many 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 years, including back in the eighties and and the early nineties, uh, my biggest client was Citibank Canada Toronto, who at the time was the biggest derivatives book in the world and served as the clearinghouse for Citibank worldwide because a lot of the derivatives that get traded today were actually invented here in Canada, or incubated here, and uh, for reasons that we don't need to get into today, but there's, there's you know, good, good history behind that too, and it's a great story. Uh, but let me, let me assure you that uh, uh, trading, trading desks do not, do not bat a thousand in, you know, quarter, quarter over quarter over quarter over quarter and, and extrapolate that out to 20 years. Uh, 
when you trade and take risk, you 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 have bad bad runs. Any anybody who gambles knows that you don't win every time. If you take a coin, if you take a coin and you flip it four times a year, and then you do that for twenty years, the odds of you getting that right every time are not good. Any gam any gambler. Even any drunk gambler knows that. But what it really comes to, you know, or it's the it's the same it's the same. Look, another analogy, uh, you know, no no angler goes out and catches uh, catches a, a a record you know a record uh, uh, a record tuna every time out on out on the water. Um, but I mean, uh, J P Morgan does. You know that's all there is to it. These these institutions do, and the reason the reason that they are so successful at fishing is because they fish in a bowl with a dip net. <laughs> and when you fish in a bowl with a dip net, you know when you're dealing with predetermined outcomes, and you have big fancy positions built around built around a predetermined outcome, it's it's very easy uh, to win every time. And you see, this this is the holographic nature of our capital markets. It's the true holographic nature of our of our capital markets, where crony capitalism is practiced to the nth degree, and where and where agents who serve the uh, deep state or the globalist entity, uh, you know, are, are are basically guaranteed wins every time. And this, of course, also lends credence or, or puts wind in the sails notionally to, to the idea that, you know, J.P. Morgan, you know, how many billions of dollars uh, have they paid for fraudulent practices in the last, you know, five, seven years? I, I mean, I, I know that the fines that they've paid amounts to tens of billions. Yeah. And yet the namesake, Mr. Diamond, uh, last week came out and made a pronouncement that Bitcoin was a fraud. <laughs> well, Mr. Diamond, well, Mr. Diamond, how many billions of dollars has J.P. Morgan paid under your uh, leadership for just that? For fraud? Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, what it really amounts to, Rory, you can't make this stuff up. No. Unfortunately, so, and I mean that that can take us off on another jag about you know about cryptocurrencies. And yeah, I mean, because because Diamond Zero Hedge reported the very next day after he made this statement that J.P. Morgan in Europe was purchasing Bitcoin. Well, but he but he had said the day before he was going to fire any of his traders caught trading it. So, I mean. <laughs> And and it's and isn't and isn't it ironic that as as Mr. Diamond was stating that Bitcoin was a fraud, he at the in the same breath stated that his daughter had traded Bitcoin and made money. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, Come on. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, what I find anyway what I find sort of ironic or, or humorous about this, and maybe possibly even in a gallows type of way, is well. Well, Mr. Diamond says that Bitcoin is a fraud out of one side of his mouth. His, his bank stock and trade is the fiat U.S. dollar. And, you know, he claims that Bitcoin is a fraud, I guess, ostensibly because Bitcoin is backed by nothing. But the U.S. fiat dollar is also backed by nothing. And... Frankly, between me and you, Rory, I think we have a better, better handle on how many Bitcoins there are in existence than we do U.S. dollars. Because we have, we have dark pools of U.S. dollars that are, that are not even acknowledged to exist. As in, namely, the, the, the dollars that are, that are sunk in this black hole called the Exchange Stabilization Fund. Well, and we just identified a minimum of 32 trillion that the IMF and the uh, GAO can't find the uh, government accounting office or the general, sure. general accounting office of the United States can't find 18 trillion IMF suddenly discovers this rounding error of 14 trillion 
I mean, you know, and the other thing that Mr. <laughs> Diamond, listen, the other thing, Rory, that Mr. Diamond has to be well aware of his his former his former uh, uh, highly decorated employee, Blythe Masters, uh, when questioned when questioned about uh, uh, the rigging of uh, precious metals markets and the naked shorts that J.P. Morgan had on their books uh, in terms of futures contracts. It was none other than Blythe Masters that said, "Well, we don't we don't take positions of our own. We only take positions for for clients." Right. And so Mr. Diamond would be well aware that the that the true other side of their of their uh, precious metal shorts are none other than the U.S. government. So you know, for Mr. Diamond to be to to be speaking about about frauds uh, uh, is really quite a mouthful. Given given the activities that his bank is engaged with as an agent for the U.S. government, uh, engaged engaged in uh, market rigging and uh, uh, creating predetermined outcomes in, all over our capital markets, and it's and this occurs not just in the precious metals area; it occurs in the interest rate uh, arena. It occur it occurs in the, in the fixed income uh, arena, and J.P. Morgan is knee deep in this and front and center with all that's going on. It's incredible, I mean, and you've got two criminals out here saying that, you know, like you were just just pointing out, J, uh, Jamie Dimon saying, you know, we've got fraud over here in Bitcoin, and and a few days before that, Jeff Christian saying there's no market manipulation. I mean, <laughs> it's, the hits just keep coming. It's, yeah. it's, it's mind-boggling that these people can sleep at night when they say these things and know the truth of the matter. But yeah. that's, that's and, how criminals, that's how they live their lives. So. And just to spend a couple minutes, now that we've brought up the, uh, uh, brought up the name Bitcoin or the term Bitcoin, and a lot of people... Uh, uh, I think maybe mistakenly or misguidedly uh, think that Bitcoin is cryptocurrency or represents all of what cryptocurrency is or stands for. And I, I've been speaking about cryptocurrencies in recent interviews and unfortunately I've had a couple of misguided meatheads uh, Take take my commentary regarding cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin uh, off the mark, and I've had them accuse me of possibly pumping Bitcoin, which uh, I can I can assure you that I'm I'm absolutely not pumping Bitcoin. But what what I've been trying to put across is the is the inherent value that is uh, contained within the underlying. Uh, uh, technology that gives Bitcoin its sustenance, and that is blockchain technology. And what blockchain technology represents is a very efficient, transparent, low-cost method of uh, uh, transmitting ownership of things on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. And you know, so when and when I say things. The things being transmitted may very well be uh, Bitcoin, a, a currency which is backed by nothing tangible, or it could also mean the transmission of tangible goods, be it precious metals or be it uh, uh, property as in real estate or be it intellectual property, which is something a little bit abstract too. And uh, uh, what, what Bitcoin uh, or the underlying uh, technology of Bitcoin, and that's the blockchain. What the blockchain does is it is it removes the requirement for a third party or an intermediary to transfer ownership of something from one place to another. So, to to give a real world example, today if you want to if you want to shift a currency unit from New York to Melbourne, Australia, you need to go to the bank, you need to give the bank the details of where you want to send the money, then you're going to probably have to fill out three or four pages of anti-money laundering 
uh, dictates the, all, all, you know, all thoughtfully uh, contrived by Homeland Security to, to help keep us all safe from, from people who live in caves and who wear togas. And, and then three days later, if, if you're lucky, the recipient in Melbourne, Australia may receive money or maybe it'll take six or seven days. Or on a blockchain, uh, uh, on a blockchain system, you, you, could, you could do the same transaction uh, within seconds or a minute. So you see, and and there'd be no question, there'd be there would be no opportunity for anyone to steal the money in process. There'd be no possible way that that uh, uh, you know a third party could say, oh well, it got it got lost in the mail, or or we're going to have to we're going to have to uh, uh, examine. You know, uh, uh, you do, you filled out one of the one of the forms the wrong way, and and therefore it's going to have to be held for another week. Uh, anyway, all I'm saying it's very efficient. It's peer to peer, and it happens almost instantaneously. And it and it what it does is it removes the possibility of swindle or fraud or somebody or something like in the case of precious metals, it would remove the possibility of a third party like an exchange. From selling your metal twice, or or in the case of Comex, maybe maybe selling every ounce that they have in their vault, maybe selling it five hundred times, maybe, so maybe maybe it, more. <laughs> so this this is what blockchain technology, if as and when it gets married to tangibles like precious metal, this is what it will prevent. And what I see this displacing, very possibly. In, in the relatively near future, would be would be uh, an instance where you have a hedge fund that wants exposure to physical precious metal. And currently today, if if you're watching the people who run these hedge funds, uh, if you see them being interviewed on the likes in Canada of Business News Network or in America on CNBC. And you'll see uh, hedge fund manager A being interviewed by the talking head of the day, uh, and and they're they're asked if they like precious metal. You know, uh, maybe one time in ten thousand they say they like metal, and uh, and they say so. How would you like to uh, you know gain exposure? And some and, and maybe one time one times in a million they'll say I'd like to hold physical metal. And then they'd say, and what would be your chosen method to do that? And they would say, typically, well, you know, through through one of the ETFs like uh, GLD or uh, SLV. And you see, these things have been sold to the investment community as being true proxies and, and to truly represent physical precious metal. Which they don't. They're frauds. But my, in, in my view, these things are fraudulent. And in my view, there will come a day when people who hold them will realize uh, when, when the almighty crap does hit the fan, uh, they're going to find out that the physical uh, 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 that they thought they held in the form of these ETFs truly wasn't physical at all. And... It's my belief that marrying physical precious metal to the uh, to the blockchain w would would prevent this, because like with regard to uh, said ETFs, um, you know, all you need to do is go look at the prospectus for either of those entities I just referenced, and you look at the language in the prospectus regarding custody and where the metal is held and who holds it and who's responsible should the metal go missing. And the language is, is ambiguous as all get out. Yeah, and, and it says uh, that, that, it can't, that, it, that it's not audited if it's held by one of their agents. Because, look, listen, they're, they're, all I'm saying to you, there's no reason for the language to be as ambiguous as it is. And, you know, the, 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 the real thing is if the metal was actually put on the blockchain with, in, in the form of a smart contract, all this ambiguity would go away. But then so would the possibility of effectively uh, selling uh, metal more than once. And, I mean, this, this, 
Anyway, you see, there's there's a, there's a there's a reason why there are cliches in the world, Rory, uh, where people say if something walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, and swims like a duck, it's a duck. And these ETFs, they they look like frauds, they smell like frauds, and you know, which leads me to the conclusion that these things are likely frauds. So, I agree. That's just the way. That's just the way the ball rolls, so and to speak. I want to change gears a little bit, uh, Rob, because you brought up something that is very important when you were when you're talking about transferring money from the United States to Australia. That money, if you use a bank or that currency, I should say, that currency passes through the SWIFT system. And the United States used that system against Iran as a financial weapon. They've just threatened, just recently, the United States threatened China with this same financial weapon. And China and Russia, independently and collectively, have their own alternatives to the SWIFT system. They have all the infrastructure built to bypass the Federal Reserve note and the world reserve currency and do they can operate completely outside of any western banking fraud i mean banking system and how why would they do that first of all why how stupid is that to threaten your number one uh, creditor and second how does that fit with what's happening with the multipolar world that we're moving to and moving away from this uh, Federal Reserve note uh, hegemony that we have. I mean, what's well, going on with that? Well, <clears throat> I have a couple thoughts on that. Um, if, if, if uh, let's just say if American interests or if globalist interests were, were uh, very in tune or aware with um, possibly the notion that China was about to abandon the SWIFT system, might they not want to trump up the pretense of uh, that they're going to throw them out of the SWIFT system? I mean, if if somebody if somebody knows they're going to get fired, would would they be would they be inclined uh, more inclined or less inclined to quit it's an excellent if you, analogy if you know you're going to get fired tomorrow would you be more or less inclined to quit tonight be more inclined wouldn't you think so so if 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 the system knows that it's going down and if the system knows that china is going to abandon the system might the system want to trump up the idea, no pun intended, but might the system want to trump up the idea that they were going to throw China out of the system? And then they could blame China for the system's demise by, by inventing the, the, the excuse that they were, they were not being, uh, you know, agreeable or they weren't working with us to, uh, to defeat the scourge. You know the, the North Korean scourge, and they were determined to trade with them, and we were left with no other choice but to to throw them out. But they were going to leave tomorrow anyway. Hmm. So I ask you that question, and I and I'm not saying that is necessarily the case, but it wouldn't surprise me if it turned out to be the case. Well, it wouldn't surprise me. Nothing would surprise me at this point, especially with our monetary system and the. And global economics, I mean, there it's it's such a, a mess at this point. I mean, you have the you had Trump on TV or not on TV, but he was at the United Nations, and I turned I just stopped listening after he was talk, telling the world, you know, that the that he just gave the military a huge raise and that it's going to be the strongest military in the world, you know, even stronger. We can kill more people now than ever before. While at the same time, this is in the back, the with the backdrop of what we were just talking about, along with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Belt and Road Initiative, the uh, North-South Corridor, the 
uh, Eurasian Economic Union, the BRICS Consortium, all of these multipolar world systems coming to fruition. They are being built out right now. All of the infrastructure to support these alliances is already in place. They just have to go to work and build the the rail system, the water system, and the uh, solar system, and whatever it is that needs to be built. But all of the supporting infrastructure, all the monetary supporting infrastructure, is already in place. Why? Why would this globalist do this? Well, it's uh, you know, I think I think it I think very likely it it, it goes back to what we were just discussing. Um, you know. Maybe, maybe before somebody, just to phrase it a slightly different way, uh, when you know somebody's going to quit, you know, you say, you're fired. I mean, is that something Donald Trump would do? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, anyway, I, and I, look, I'm not trying to pile on to Trump, but all, all I'm saying is the, the, the world financial edifice, which I believe is a complete hologram uh, relative to what we're told versus what reality is. Um, and, and many, many, many commentators have been, have, been, have been piling on saying that, you know, we're, we're due for some very, very serious, serious problems. Um, um, and, uh, you know, the, the can has been kicked down the road and we've run out of road and we're at the end of the road. And uh, yeah, many, many, many market forecasters have been saying that this is this. I've been around. They're, they're nobodies. They're regular people. And when people stop, that's why they put on all of these shows. Like you got this little Katzon Macron over there in, in, uh, in, in, in France. At, the, at Versailles, putting on all these side shows. So the people get taken in with the theatrics. There's nothing there. It's an old man behind a curtain with a dog. It's the Wizard of Oz. And what's happening now, Catalonia, that's a big one to watch. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. They're, they're threatening the people to have a vote. They're going to bring in the, the truth. What, didn't the Spanish overthrow the joint and now they, the people want it back? You know, it wasn't always part of Spain. A fascist overtook it. Oh, he was the king, the king. Yeah, here comes the king. You know, so what I'm saying is, Richie, the opportunities now have never been better. Never. Never. Never better. Just, but we, we've got about five minutes left on this, and knowing you, you probably have um, plenty more uh, media appearances to do today. But you, in this quarters edition of the journal which which i got yesterday i've been flicking through it uh, i'll read it thoroughly over the next couple of days as i always do and i'll make reference to um some of it in future programs go to trendsresearch.com folks subscribe to the journal uh, i don't endorse anything really on this program i endorse it because it's brilliant i've been reading it for years uh, gerald salenti is our guest um just to talk about you know you're talking a lot about propaganda and I saw an amazing article written by an independent journalist the other day about how the elites and about how the media are trying to basically crack down on uh, our right to cause offence as a means to starting a public debate on anything, Gerald, you know. So you might have an opinion about an Irish broadcaster was fired recently because after he said, Gerald, that a young girl who was raped didn't deserve it, didn't ask for it, didn't do anything um, wrong, she didn't deserve it at all, and the bastard should go to prison for years. He then said, but the girl was comatose on the floor of a bathroom because she got so drunk um, she couldn't stand up. And he asked the question, do we need to have a conversation about personal responsibility? So the feminazis and the Irish media said that he was victim-blaming and basically have had him thrown out of his job. It's a massive story in Ireland. It's localised, but it has implications for broadcasters and writers the world over. And there's been a, quite a number of stories like this recently, where somebody has said something harmless to start a conversation, and yet they were shut down very quickly. You mentioned the trans issue. We've had that over here where broadcasters who are against, you know, um, people using bathrooms 
other than the gender with which they were assigned, which is a fair point of view, and everybody's entitled to their opinion. They've been threatened as well. It's kind of tyrannical. I know you've spoken a lot about this. What do you think? Well, again, think of what the things you're talking about. All these, you know, identity issues. Nothing about the major issues. Nothing about war. Nothing about peace. Nothing about freedom. Nothing about enlightenment. So that's what they're doing. As I mentioned, you had these moronic Emmys. Yeah. All it was was a hate Trump show. And all these little clowns, these little nothing boys and girls, not a man or woman among them, not one word about, oh, we're in Afghanistan now for how many years and they're sending more troops? Oh, we just had 9-11, totally out of the news. Oh, the United States is slaughtering people in how many nations? So, and I'm thinking <laughs> of sports. The last place I had my mother, man, so rest in peace, a great Italian, you know, woman, you know, she's, I mean, Italian women spoil their sons. Yeah, I'm eating the finest food possible to be cooked. I'm going to go to military school? Trump was so narcissistic, they sent this rich, rich little boy to military school, not far from us in Kingston over here, in Cornwall, New York, a little, a little uh, concentration camp. Now, here this guy, look at the pictures, Google it up, Trump in military school, dressed up in military drag, learning how to make his bed with the right corners and eating crappy food and saluting. Yeah, I salute. I got a salute for you. You see that one? This is what this little boy is doing. And now Trump is back in military school, taking orders from the same guys that used to give it to him at New York Military Academy. And, these are, and with the Goldman Sachs gang in charge as well. And these are men, of course, they're neoconservative to the bone. Zionist no, they're not the neoconservatives. No, I'm sorry. You don't they're think sick so. SOBs. Yeah. They're psychopaths. They're little boys with bad attitudes that love to kill people and haven't had a victory to mark up. If I'm in business and I'm showing one failure after another, I'm not in business. But these arrogant guys with their bad attitudes and guns that they'll kill you with keep killing without one victory. Not one victory, but a lot of bad attitude, arrogance, and murder. Well, you said it all. I mean, the, war, the, the government's, you know, look at the centerfold of the Trends Journal. It's done by Anthony Frieda. It's my, my, my concept and Anthony Frieda, great illustrator's work. And it's, here's, a, here's a, a gift for your beloved family and friends who ignore the facts. And we have the presidential reality show. And then under it, who's your favorite freak? And we have all the freaks from all the political parties, the central bankers, and on and on. So all it is, you have freaks running your country. I mean, look at little, look, one freak after another you got over there. The same here. Go to Germany. Hey, you been in France lately? It's a freak show. People are letting freaks run and ruin their lives. I mean, look at them. How could anybody with a half a brain listen to them? So they're all little sellouts. They're nobodies that have never worked a day in their lives, been sucking off the public tit and telling you what to do. That's Brexit. They could care less about the people. I just told you that in the United States, they just voted for a $700 billion defense budget. And then when you put in the black ops and the CIA, all the other stuff, we're looking over a trillion. Well, now they just had hurricanes in Houston and Florida, and the, the homeowners are losing everything. They give them a couple of pennies. Where are the troops? You mentioned they're, what, in over 80, 800 bases overseas? Yeah. How come the troops aren't there rebuilding these homes? You know why? Because that's what they think of the Americans just like your May over there. Who's that other guy? Johnson with that funny hair. What's his name? Boris, Boris Johnson. Boris yeah. who? Boris Johnson. Boris Clown? Yeah. Boris Moron? Boris Imbecile? Boris, you little piece of crap, nothing? How could anybody, I, how could anybody, anybody with a half a brain take orders from that little clown? And look what they do. Here comes the queen, man. Roll out the red carpet. Dress up all these little guys in their military drag and salute every country. You look at Trump going out of the helicopter, saluting this little clown next to him. Yeah, I, I salute. I got one for you. 
Look what's going on. When are people going to have some courage? When are they going to stand up? Hey, look what they just had the Emmys. Oh, it was a big deal. Oh, it was all anti-Trump. Not one word. Not one word for these little clowns over there in Hollywood. You're little losing little pieces of garbage about peace. Not nothing about the wars going on. All these little, oh, we need more transgender bathrooms. Yeah, how about taking a leak in the street? Absolutely right. Can I- nothing about peace. How can anybody that has a half a brain look up to a Boris clown or a Trump or a Clinton or an Obama or a Bush or a Penis Cheney? It's the people, man. I've had it. I'm so sick of writing down the facts anymore. It's a freak show and everybody loves their freak. Don't ever get tired of writing the journal, um, mate. I, I mean that. It's absolutely vital that there's some semblance of free media in uh, the US and in um, in the UK. Um, we might have just... Um, we, we just lost you momentarily. Thanks for calling okay. back there. I was Everybody making the point... Everybody loves their freak. Yeah. It's a freak show. And when are the people going to stand up? How many more facts do you need? How many more facts do people need that they're getting shafted? It's a multinational takeover. You're, you're a slave for the multinationals. Taxes. Taxes so the elite could live better. And the politicians. So anyway, that's where I'm at. I understand. It might sound a bit patronizing, me saying to you, I understand your frustration because I've, I've not been alive to this for anywhere near as long as you have. And I certainly haven't been doing what you've been doing for nearly four decades or, or longer telling people the truth but I just wonder if there's just a tiny bit of optimism to be found in a couple of bad stories yes you know what I mean the the optimism Richie is that we have an opportunity to change it now that we've never had before because it's such an obvious freak show we that's what I love about Trump we got a freak now that's ahead of the freak show you got freaks in the UK you need a bigger freak than the two you that and than who you got running the joint May now. Again, Boris Karloff over there. Yeah, <laughs> it's the story I'm thinking of. A big story broke here today. The Electoral Commission, which is the watchdog for elections in the UK, has recommended that internet trolls who target politicians have their right to vote taken away from them. And another couple of very interesting stories like that. A couple of very well-known broadcasters have lost their jobs for giving an opinion, a pretty harmless opinion, on a couple of social issues. And we know that in this coming parliament, the UK government is going to try and crack down on what they call online extremism, which basically means, you know, anybody who disagrees with them. But in those stories, Gerald, I get a bit of optimism because, like you touched on there, they seem to know that they're not safe. They seem to know that something is coming for them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be acting the way they're acting. I don't know if you agree with that. I agree 100%. They know it. Look, I, I, I've, been in, I've been there at, 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 20, at a graduate school. I was the number two guy running the, political, the mayoral campaign in Yonkers, New York. I mean, this is a city of 300,000 people. I was the assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate. I was the chief government affairs specialist for a major portion of the chemical industry in D.C. I know I got pictures of me and Ronald Reagan, John Connolly. I met with General Anthony Zinni. I've been with, I met with Major, your, your clown over there. I, I've been with Prince's, cut out a third of it, and that totals the, what they cut out, a billion dollars. And what is, what is Bill Gates worth? About 80 something billion. <laughs> and of course, North Korea has been a threat to the world. Look what they did, those North Koreans lying, lying right in front of our faces to everybody to hear that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and ties to Al Qaeda. And look what the North Koreans did to obliterate, to destroy an entire nation of Iraq, kill over a million people. Oh, and those North Koreans, you know, after their leader won the Nobel Peace of Crap Prize, yeah, what he said was that 
I'm going to send 33,000 more troops into Afghanistan. And then Gaddafi has to go. Then those North Koreans, look what they did to Libya. Look how they destroyed a sovereign nation that did nothing to anyone. And those North Koreans, Assad has to go, I says. So look what they've done. They slaughtered over 500,000 Syrians, those North Koreans. We got to watch them constantly. Now they're in Somalia. They're in Sudan. Oh, yeah. You know, of course, I'm being <laughs> talking about America. <laughs> yeah. North Korea has not done anything to anybody. The United States is dropping bombs on their border. Could you imagine if North Korea was dropping bombs and they had a deal with Canada and they're dropping bombs on the Canadian U.S. border and over to our off Newport News over there to the to the east. We got the Chinese doing massive maneuvers over at Newport News and down in the Gulf of Mexico. We got the Russians and over there in California, we got the Iranian fleet doing massive, quote, war games. How long would America tolerate that? About five minutes. They'd be bombing the hell out of them. But the United States is doing this to every country that they don't like. And the prostitute little media, these little boys and girls, I have to be equal. They're nothing more than political whores. They get paid to put out. They get paid to put out propaganda, and that's one of the major stories in the Trends Journal, the propaganda that they're selling us. So now let's go back, Richie, to the Korean War. Started by the United States after they propped up a dictator in South Korea that was in bed with the Japanese, who, of course, you know, they had those wonderful women that they turned into slaves over there so they could have sex with the, with the Japanese soldiers. You remember those, yeah, right? Yeah. We won't talk about that. The United States took that guy that was working with the Japanese and put him as the head of South Korea. The United States killed over 4 million North Koreans in the Korean War. The pilots used to radio back, there's nothing left to bomb. Look at the photos of North Korea. You see all new buildings. It's not like they just invented the joint, you know, 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. They destroyed everything. So now I am a believer in Second Amendment rights, the right to bear arms. That doesn't mean I'm going to use them. Why isn't North Korea allowed to bear arms, considering what they saw happen to Gaddafi and to Hussein? When they didn't have nuclear weapons, Jack, you're dead. So here we are. Remember those old gunfights they used to show on TV? You know, those old Westerns and the two guys are facing off each other. And their hands are ready to grab the guns, you know. They had them strapped around their waist. Now, suppose we're watching one of those and you and I are in the gunfight. And I say to you, hey, Richie, let's not draw. Let's talk first. And you say, OK. And then I'd say to you, as I'm pointing my gun at you, but drop your gun and then we'll talk. Yeah, yeah. North Korea has been wanting to talk with Americans about peace forever. And all Americans keep saying is we won't talk to you until you dismantle your defensive and offensive military systems. America is threatening North Korea with 300,000 troops on its borders. These massive, quote, war games. Oh, and look at the major media now. All these, again, these little prostitutes, these boys and girls that get paid to put out by their Washington Johns and their corporate war masters. How about Russia's having military drills, you know, with Belarus? Yes, that's right. Major front page, front page of the Financial Times today. But America has these massive drills off the shores and borders of North Korea which are basically drills to attack the joint, and that doesn't make the news, or barely does. Bases in so every country. that's what I have to say about North Korea. Bases in every country in the world, well, most countries in the world as well, surrounding Russia with military bases. How serious, I mean, we saw that, that test, and again, I, I'm not agreeing with you just for the sake of agreeing with you. I, I'd like to find a devil's advocate position to take against what you say to make it interesting for our listeners, it is interesting for our listeners, but I can't argue with you, Gerald, of course I can't. So he's understandably doing weapons readiness tests 
for the eventuality that he's attacked that's Kim Jong Un if those tests continue and another long range missile is tested a couple of thousand miles or a couple of thousand kilometres how serious is that in terms of the possible response from the United States is Trump just playing to the gallery talking about destroying people because we've heard from more sensible I know you haven't I know the media it's, it's, it's probably only slightly better here than it is in America it isn't really but we've had a couple of you know more sensible voices here today speaking on British news saying look it's silly by Trump they're not going to bomb North Korea because they would be able to obliterate the South within a matter of minutes so what is likely to be the Trump government's response in the event of another test yeah, what they did, what they just passed a uh, a new bill, seven hundred billion dollars for the military. That's what they're doing. Yeah, it's the military industrial complex, and and what we have now is we have the military running Americans' government. This is anathema to everything that that um, this country was founded upon. Eisenhower would be turning in his grave, a five star general. Supreme commander of the Allied forces who warned that the military industrial complex was robbing the nation of the genius of the scientists, sweat of the laborers, and future of the children. And now it's happened. Who's running the White House? Mad Dog Mattis, McMaster, Kelly, three generals in top positions. As we wrote in this Trends Journal, Trump is merely back in military school. That's all it is. He's taking orders from the generals. You know, and Trump and I are the same age. I may have said this on your, on your show before. The greatest threat when I was a kid, when, <laughs> believe me, you know, I was, they couldn't control me. Your little <laughs> SOB, we had enough of this. You're going to military school. That was the great threat. Now, here you are. You're a teenager, teenage boy. You know, grew up in the Bronx and Yonkers. What are you thinking of? Thinking of girls? Girls, I'm yeah. thinking of a car. <laughs>